so good to see you. Thank you so much for coming. I think you'll be uh, pleasantly entertained tonight with uh, this presentation of MIT Enterprise Forum. My name is Chris Steinhardt. I'm the chair of MIT Enterprise Forum here in San Diego. Um, I think that we offer those of you that come, uh, that haven't been here, the type of program you can't get anywhere else. We have business owners that have graciously consented to tell us about some problems they're having with their business. There's a panel of experts that will talk to them after the business owners get uh, done giving a presentation about their business. And uh, after about 40 minutes of that, we'll turn it over to you, the audience, to ask the, the people the same questions and, and give advice as well. Um, I'm also a partner here at Kenobi Martins. We're a sponsor and the host. Uh, Kenobi Martins is an intellectual property firm with offices here in San Diego, of course, Irvine, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Washington, D.C., and New York. We're an IP boutique, but we're a big one. There's close to 300 of us. We've been in business since 1962. This office here in San Diego has been in business since 1984. We work with the gamut of inventors from small startups up to uh, very large Fortune 50 companies. We can add value to your company. We've been doing it for years, and, and we're, we have a, a wide variety of technical backgrounds so that you can come in and we can get started right away without you doing the kind of education that uh, you might do at other firms. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Bob Spears and Dr. Steve Harrington of Childine. Um, their resumes are on these little papers that you've got in front of you, so I won't read those to you. But Childine has a, a really clever system of cooling servers down. And I'm, with that, I'm going to turn it over to those guys. Thank you again for coming. Well, super. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. I'm Bob Spears and with Steve Harrington. And we're with Childine up in Carlsbad. And I'm the president and CEO. I joined Steve a little more than a year ago. Steve founded the company. He's been running the company Flowmetrics up in Carlsbad for um, 25 years or so. Um, we've engineered and patented a way to safely deploy liquid cooling into data centers. Uh, this yields significant financial and operational gains. And we got into this business when someone told Steve a few years ago that 50% of the electricity used in a data center goes to cooling the servers, and bear in mind these are servers that don't particularly care how cold they are, they don't sweat. So it seemed like a business opportunity to Steve, and he's been pursuing it for the last couple of years. So Childline has been over-incubated to a certain extent because we were out raising funds and we got a, a sale, a, a major installation, and then we got a mother, made another major installation <coughs> from the same customer. Uh, <clears throat> so now we're in the position where we're we're trying to overcome the, the small company mindset where we need to find big customers, but the big customers aren't sure if they can trust the small company. So that's what we're we've come here to talk to you about, and we'll discuss these questions with our board of directors after the talk. So our proposition is rather than just installing air conditioning to cool a data center by blowing cold air across a hot server with fans, we would remove the server heat with, li with our liquid cooling system. And to give you an idea of the scale of the dollars involved in this problem, 65 billion a year are sold of new server hardware every year. And 60 billion a year is spent globally on data center construction. Last year, 40 billion of that 60 was spent in the US, and the amount of spend on data centers in the US last year was more than the three previous years combined. Included in that 125 billion of spend is 10 billion of spending on cooling equipment to go into the servers or the data center. Um, eight billions on the data center side, two billions on the server side, it's into that market that we're targeting our business. Globally, this data center electricity usage is becoming a really big problem. Right now, data centers consume 3% of the world's electricity. IBM projects that number will triple 
in the next 15 years. U.S. data centers spend $7 billion a year on electricity right now. Half of that, $3.5 billion, goes into cooling. Our technology drops the electrical use and cooling by 20 to 40 percent, which means that savings to the data center industry in the U.S. is worth $700 million to $1.4 billion per year in energy savings. We developed a safe way to deploy liquid cooling that eliminates the risks of leaks. Uh, it's unique in the industry. Chris and I were just talking about that. And we've had two large sales to Korea, to government labs with very high-powered computers. And the first of these installations has been working as expected for the last two and a half years. And that same Korean partner we sold to two and a half years ago just bought again with a second large Korean government installation. So liquid cooling is not new. IBM and Cray have been doing it since the 70s. Um, but it hasn't been widely adopted since then. And I think it's because of the fear of leaks. That's what we get from the data center operators. And also the cost and the expense of maintaining the liquid cooling system. So we've solved these problems. We've solved the fear of leaks problem. And we have a system that's easy to install and maintain. It has automated fill, drain, and water quality. Our first in installations were for a local server OEM who couldn't quite uh, ship an air-cooled system because it just wouldn't cool. That's the Korea jobs that, that Bob was talking about. <clears throat> we provided a simple modification server that made an air-cooled server. But still, servers today are mostly air inside, just like phones were back in the 70s. As the server density goes up, <clears throat> the servers are going to be more powerful and faster, and they're going to have to be liquid-cooled. If you think about it, the server of the future is going to be a solid block of electronics, just like an iPhone. It's going to have power and cooling connections and internet connections, <clears throat> but it's going to be a solid block. And there's no way that's going to work unless it's liquid cool. So we believe that our approach is going to make this liquid cooled server of the future, it's basically a solid block of electronics, a, a possibility. <clears throat> so. Now, the, the, need for liquid, the need for cooling on the data center side has become more acute, primarily because the, the power in the server chips have gone up remarkably. Um, when, IB, when Intel came out with their first Xeon server chip, it had 38 watts of power. Fast forward 20 years, their high-spec server chip has 205 watts, which is a 6x increase in power. And now a high-powered GPU cluster server can have 10,000 watts of power in a single chassis, which is the equivalent of heat or power that's in 10 homes. Interest in high-power uh, serving servers is spreading beyond universities and national labs really driven by the interest in artificial intelligence, virtual reality, um, and deep learning. And NVIDIA is benefiting from that. Their most recent data center segment sales were up 187% year on year to $2 billion. That's, they went from one to two in one year. That's a big move. Our system cuts uh, cooling costs 20 to 40% and let servers be in a more dense format. So as an example, our most recent Korean installation has 30 kilowatts of power in one server rack footprint. That's you know two feet by four feet. That same 30 kilowatts of server power in a normal air conditioned environment would be in five or six footprints. So you can go from five or six footprints of real estate being used to one. Ron, would you like to reclaim four <laughs> footprints of uh, data center space supercomputer? So there you go. Um, one research group forecasts that uh, li the liquid cooling market by 2022 will be a $3 billion a year opportunity. So the benefits of liquid cooling are well known but if you tell a data center operator we're going to put water in your servers, their first response is, <laughs> yeah, no, you're not. And then because they're afraid of leaks and damages and dogs sleeping with cats and all sorts of things. So here's what uh, we show them. 
we will show them a, a, what we call our cut the line video to show them that nothing bad happens. This is an example of a really bad leak. And you can do this <clears throat> right now if you want. We, we were doing that out with margaritas going through. If, if this was a positive pressure system, it'd be like sticking a knife in a garden hose. You'd have water spraying all over the data center. But since we're using negative pressure, the water goes back to both ends in the reservoir. And we, since we leave the fins on top of the heat sink and put water through the base, we still have fans in place that'll cool the computer with that heat sink since the fans go back up to full speed. You have backup air cooling, no downtime while you figure out who just cut the, the line with your little snips in there. Okay, why, why chill line for liquid cooling? Well, <clears throat> we have a, a unique product, okay? And as Bob just mentioned, we talk to data center operators, the first thing they say is, what about leaks? We bring in the demo, they cut the line, they don't ask us about leaks anymore. The, the whole system, the whole ecosystem that we developed, we developed it talking to all these large data center operators uh, like eBay, ServiceScale, and, uh, and others. San Diego Supercomputer Center. <laughs> exactly. The key issue that people worry about in the data center operations business is uptime. If you don't have uptime, Nobody else cares about anything. So we have a system with backup air cooling, extra redundant CDUs, and failover valves so that we can ensure 100% uptime for our customers. <clears throat> so we also have a lot of good intellectual property. Uh, we are uh, the Flowmetrics, which is the company that spun off Chillbine. And we have a lot of patents. Uh, we know how to do patents. We know the difference between a good patent and a, a pretty wall decoration that you can put on your office. So far, we've had um, $2 million. In, or we have three experienced executives that are ready to join any moment. And we have good uh, market interest and customer traction. Uh, we've, we've sold $2 million of the hardware twice to the same customer. It must have worked. And the engineers and technology specialists at the major server vendors are aware of our technology. They like it. They're waiting for some market pull. They're waiting for a data center operator to ask them for it uh, before they spend a lot of time and effort evaluating our technology. So in terms of what our solution offers our customers, we can save you 20 to 40% of your electricity and your water, which is still an important consideration, even though the drought theoretically is not as bad. Where your customer is on that range depends on how much money they've already spent on installing a lot of very expensive air handling equipment. We do have a, a case study in the back of our deck that shows a 16-month payback on someone installing a new data center. Um, in recent years, up until now, data centers have been focusing largely on putting data centers in cold climates, so think Pacific Northwest, where they have access to, it's, it's cheaper to cool a data center because you've got free air cooling 205, 300 days a year up there. And you also have access to cheap hydroelectric power. But now fast forward a few years, they're starting to see the need to put more servers and data center closer to their users because it takes too long to have all the data go back and forth from Florida up to you know, Oregon and Texas to Oregon and back. So they're starting to put data centers in Omaha, Des Moines, uh, Dallas. None of these places are particularly hospitable to data centers. It's a hot climate. And if you talk about Dallas, that's, that's much more expensive real estate than rural Oregon. Our system, so finally we have a, an environment where reclaiming that five footprint of server space means something economically because you're not having as big a data center for the output of computers you're putting in there. We, uh, oops, went too far. we feel our approach is superior because it's cheaper and easier to install. Uh, we're compatible with traditional data center layout. And because we're able to use inexpensive fittings because of our negative pressure, a leak doesn't damage anything. So cheaper fittings inside the server is really important because servers only have a three to five year useful life. So whatever value you're gonna put in that server, you're gonna throw away or recycle in three to five years. So if you have a choice between putting really expensive stuff in an IBM server and throwing that out in three or five years or putting cheap stuff in ours that isn't gonna leak, 
you're going to save money in the long run with that approach. So let's look at the, uh, the various liquid cooling systems that we're up against. The horizontal axis shows uh, environmental and financial savings versus traditional air cooling. So air cooling is in the middle with zero savings. And then uh, the vertical axis is how compatible it is with existing server systems. And of course, traditional air cooling is 100% um, compatible. So IBM has been doing liquid cooling for a long time. Um, their stuff is expensive, and they're actually looking for outside vendors to help them to reduce costs. HP and Dell developed their own in-house systems, but they weren't commercially successful. Um, in, the, in the other corner, we have immersion systems where you take your server and dump it into a vat of oil or uh, some high-tech cooling fluids. Um, those require a lot of change in the data center. You have to do a lot more work to service the servers, and all of your racks, instead of being vertical, are now horizontal. So our closest competitors that we have to worry about are Cool IT and Asetet. These companies have been selling gamer systems where it's one Z CPU, one fan, and it comes sealed with no connections. Now, in a data center, you're going to have thousands of connections to connect up all those servers to your liquid cooling system. There's no way to get around it. Just one leak in one of those connections, and you've got an angry customer. So, in fact, one of their customers has, we talked to them, they said, can you hook up your negative pressure liquid cooling system to their you know, servers? Sure, no problem. Then you won't have to worry about leaks anymore. It's you too. So here's our, um, <clears throat> our, our patents. <clears throat> Basically, we started with a rocket fuel pump that we developed for NASA. We had a couple of patents on that. We adapted the technology to work under negative pressure for liquid cooling computers. Flowmetrics licensed those patents to Chillbine for that application. And then all the subsequent patents were issued to Chill. Chill line, that is. We have a, a, a patent pending on our turbulator that makes our heat sink low cost and allows us to leave the fins on. We just filed a patent on our CDUG, which is a new design of our server, that, of our um, CDU that's more scalable. And we have more IP in the pipeline, better cold plates, a giant CDU for somebody like Google that has lots and lots of servers, and liquid, cool for other, liquid cooling for other components and other things besides uh, servers. Um, in terms of our management team, Steve and I have been working together on that joint team about a year, year and a half ago. Um, after my, getting my MBA from Harvard, um, I spent 10 years with the computer company Gateway, most notably setting up their European and Asian operations. Um, I was the founding managing director of Gateway Europe and grew it from zero to 1,200 employees doing 435 million of sales in two years. After Gateway, I then worked in a series of small companies, most notably uh, turning around a venture-backed company um, in Albuquerque. Steve is Childine's CTO, receiving his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in aerospace engineering from U UCSD in San Diego State. At Flowmetrics, he's been solving companies' fluid flow and thermal problems for 35 years. Every spring at San, UC San Diego, he teaches a senior design class in rocketry where the students wrap up their course by testing liquid rockets in the desert. We have three additional team members ready to join post-funding. Our business development executive has had been selling liquid cooling into large computer companies for decades and has enormous industry credibility. The sales exec we know uh, well is now at IBM selling to HPC customers. And when he was at Cirrascale, he made the initial large Korean sale for Childine that, uh, from Cirrascale where we came in and cooled it on behalf of uh, Childine. Um, we have a COO identified who has years of experience with several San Diego medical technology companies and he's familiar with setting up and managing a network of sub-suppliers and contract manufacturers like we would be doing at Childine. We have significant traction from customers and investors so far. We've got 800K of um, convertible debt from various investors. Uh, we use that to develop the technology uh, for the first system and then to, to kind of commercialize it and make it more manufacturable for the second um, sale. Uh, we sold 
the, the CDUs that we built, the cooling distribution units, they were built by DNK Engineering in Rancho Bernardo, and that's a contract manufacturer, so if we get an order for lots and lots of CDUs, which we're hoping to get any minute now, um, they'll be able to manufacture, us for, manufacture them for us. Um, we're, we're ready to grow the company, the utilities uh, like us. We've been talking to SDG&E and, and SCE. Um, we're working with the Electric Power Research Institute on a, 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 a demo system, and they are <clears throat> they're testing our servers, proving out the power savings so that you, people can go to the utilities and get a rebate up to half of, of our installation costs. And <clears throat> we have some strategic initiatives that we're, we're, Bob's going to discuss in a second. And then the, the goal is to get funding to make us a stronger company so that people will, will trust us with their servers. So I'd like to take a minute to show you how the products we're selling get from us to our customer. The first customer group we're targeting is the high performance computing sector, HPC on this chart. They really have to have liquid cooling given the power of the servers they'd like to use. And we're, we're in discussions with these three national labs about having them buy and evaluate our technology. Post-purchase, they would then act as reference sites and tell other companies about their Chilldine experience. Second large group we'd be going after are the large cloud providers. They have a strong incentive to reduce costs as they operate their own servers that they rent out to their customers. We feel they'll respond positively to the results and reports from the national labs buy a demo system to evaluate in their IT lab, and then buy a, strong, a larger system. The hardest customer group for us to target initially will be the co-location data center on the bottom right here, because they just rent out floor space in a cold room for customers to bring in their own server equipment. Remember, our solution installs half inside the facility and half inside the server, so this will require the Colo's customers to install our liquid cooling equipment in their servers. That's not an easy sale up front, but we also believe that once the solution is validated by the national labs and some of the cloud data centers, this third Colo group will start to come along. We're in the universe over here on the, on the left of data center equipment OEMs like Cisco, Mellanox, Schneider Electric, Panduit, and there's also over here a series of well-known CPU, GPU, OEM companies, Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, and server computer makers, um, including Cirascale, whose servers we've cooled now twice in these large Korean sales we've made. Equipment suppliers on the left <coughs> typically relate and sell to the end user customers on the right by selling through the channel. So these are channel partners. I'm putting up here four types of channel partners. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different names for these groups in the middle, but what they have in, in common is that they buy and they resell equipment from the equipment suppliers on the left and the customers on the right. <clears throat> they mark up the sale. They provide installation and after sales service support um, and this is a very well tried and true path to get products from the left side to the right. We would have someone on site to commission our equipment like we just did in Korea with the channel partner. Um, our Korean reseller previously was a VAR for IBM setting up and supporting IBM equipment in Korea. So we knew about data centers in general, but nothing in specifics about cooling equipment. We successfully trained our Korean VAR in how to operate and support our cooling equipment, and it's been a great experience for all involved for the last two plus years. Some customers have their own internal support capabilities and will buy direct from a supplier, bypassing the VARs and the system integrator channel. Um, and of note is the list of equipment suppliers on the left is, are good examples of the types of companies that will have an interest in acquiring Chilldine at some point in the future. So for our, our 
go-to-market strategy, our first customers that we're looking at are the high-performance computing customers, particularly those national labs. They're not afraid of doing things that are a little bit risky. They want to be on the leading edge. They want to be able to write papers about the great things they did. <clears throat> They're also less price sensitive as well. So we're talking to them soon. We do a demo system for them, shows them how it works. We already did a tiny demo for San Diego Supercomputer. And um, <clears throat> then they buy a, a major system, and then they become a reference site that we can show to other people. So, because uh, right now, our Korean labs, nobody wants to go 7,000 miles for a data center tour. Um, so the next market is, <laughs> is the, the biggest market would be the cloud enterprise people, the ones that Bob was talking about. For now, they've not migrated to the high power servers. They use low power racks, you know, five kilowatts or so. But as they use more of the, the artificial intelligence, virtual reality, all that type of high power GPU powered um, computing, they're going to start deploying high power racks. And that's our opportunity to get in there and do some liquid cooling. Um, the, the VARs and system integrators, those are key partners for us because they know when the data center is expanding, they know when the data center servers are about to be retired and they need, need new ones. So we just follow them in on their overall equipment sale and we, uh, we share the margin and, and they, uh, they, share the, they share the profit. Our, at this point, our most pressing need is funding to help us become a larger, more, more successful company. We've broken the tasks we need to perform into two discrete chunks. A first group of initiatives that will take 12 to 18 months after an initial million dollar seed round. And then a second group of tasks will be done after that with a second Series A round of, we think, $3 million. Our first initiative, and we've been working on this uh, uh, for a number of months, primarily since our supercomputer, SC17 supercomputer show in Denver in November, is to get our equipment installed in a US national lab so prospective customers can go see our solution working in the US. I can't even go see the equipment we have installed in Korea, so never mind <laughs> one of you. So we're already in discussions with several national labs about this, and funding may come from a CEC grant that we just applied for with uh, San Diego State in November. And John is around here somewhere. Like no one, there he is. Fingers crossed. <laughs> OK. Our second initiative is to finish up the EPRI study work. Uh, their report will allow the utility company to pay our customer a cash rebate when they buy our equipment. Think of how much more affordable an electric vehicle is because of the federal incentives to purchase the car. Um, our third initiative is to commercialize our CDUG scalable pumping platform. We, this is what we just filed IP on. There's a one and a half million dollar CEC grant open that we hope to pursue, we hope to pursue with EPRI and the California National Lab to commercialize this CDU into a lower capacity product than our current CDU. This lower capacity product will not only be a second product offering to data center customers, but will allow us to extend our liquid cooling to other non-data center applications like electric vehicles, EV battery charging systems, 5G cellular signal amplifiers, utility scale battery cooling, to name just a few. The following, the follow-on Series A investment round, we were shown at $3 million, would build on the platform funded by the previous seed round. The national lab reference sites will allow larger cloud enterprise data centers to see our solution at work and to talk to customers. One of Childline's unique strengths is that even though we're a small company, we have technical skills better than any of our large cloud enterprise data center customers in fluid flow and thermodynamics. Uh, the large EV manufacturing quote we submitted just today reinforces that. <clears throat> Once we start receiving larger system orders from cloud enterprise customers, we'll be able to deliver quickly and with high quality through our contract manufacturing partner, DNK, in Rancho Bernardo. Installation and support will be by a service company like Source Support, 
who we worked with in connection with a small Dell system that we installed at Los Alamos. The working prototype and initial commercialized CDUG product that we built during the seed stage with CEC grant money would then be used to approach other companies in other industries to incorporate our negative pressure cooling into new or upgraded products that they'd be selling to their customers. You ready for us, Chris? Because <laughs> yeah, we, we also can do military hardware too. <clears throat> so the, uh, here, these are our financials. It's a bit of an eye test. It's uh, better than it was before. Thank you for the help during the dry run. Uh, we are showing here one in $3 million investment rounds in 2018 and 2019. We show slightly more revenue and unit shipments in 2018 than we did in 2017. And those are pretty close to our 2017 actuals. Despite having more business development resources this year than we had in the past and the attendance at trade shows going back to the big one we had with the booth in Denver. We already have firm leads on not four of the nine systems that we showed delivering in 2018. Just today, we sent out a $500,000 quote to a major EV car manufacturer. Um, and you can probably imagine, we can't say their name. And we have a call with uh, Bill Gates' little company tomorrow. Um, when the customer replaces servers we're cooling, they have to buy new cooling parts to put in the server, have our parts have to put in the server by the survey OEM. So remember, half of our original sales price is on the infrastructure side, the other half is on the server. So when those servers get swapped out, we have to put new, we get to sell half the order again. There's a little bit of a recurring revenue. Um, we show the refresh happening at the four year point in our model, and we are showing 50% gross margin on the refresh, although frankly we expect the refresh to be much higher gross margin than that. In addition, we receive half of the service contract revenue that we split with our VAR partner. And the combination of these two factors amounts to two and a half million of sales in 2022, uh, which is actually 4% of that year's sales. And also of note is that we're assuming that the price we'll receive per watt of cooling as we sell systems will go down 10% per year from a dollar a watt in 2018 to 65 cents a lot by 2022. So we think that's being very conservative. All right. Um, the, I'm missing one little, here it is. Um, one idea we're considering is changing our model from an equipment sale to an energy savings model sale where we'd only be paid on the energy savings realized by the customers. We could move there in the future but for now, we want to sell the equipment until we can prove the value of our solution and customers will receive the purchase rebate from their utility. Once our technology is more accepted and we're proven as a company and have access to debt capital for the equipment financing, we can reconsider our business model. Most of the growth in operating expenses in the sales and marketing line, followed by engineering and ops, and finally, general and admin. We are including the $150,000, 10% match for a million five CEC grant in 2019. In year five, EBITDA numbers are $21 million, which with an eight to 12 EBITDA multiple would have an enterprise value between 170 and $250 million. This is, would be a return multiple to our investors of between an eight and 14 times with the seed investors receiving higher returns than Series A. So to, to sum up, um, liquid cooling for high performance data centers will be essential. We talked to Roy Campbell at the DOD and he said all their supercomputers going forward are gonna be liquid cooled. So uh, we have Density going up with the CPUs, the GPUs, we have the edge data centers, we have the data centers moving into Dallas and the Midwest. All those can't just use free air cooling. So people have been searching for a way to do the liquid cooling in a safe and easy manner. I think we'll be a strong contender in this, in this growing market for liquid cooling. Um, we, have a good, we have a good value. The only thing that's holding us back right now 
is the fact that our company is so small that people don't want to bet on us. You spend $20 million on a supercomputer and a million dollars of that is your liquid cooling system and the company that sold you the liquid cooling system is only a million dollar company. You're a little worried about whether they're going to be around um, you know, in five years when you need service. So we really need some financial backing to increase the confidence of our potential customers. So there's our, our challenges. <clears throat> um, they're still the same three challenges we started with. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming by, and I, I look forward to hearing all of your questions. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Orlando, and I am the uh, founder and chief sales and oh, as of today, I'm uh, chief executive officer, CEO of Scale Matrix. We had some organizational changes today. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate that. Uh, my business partner is actually taking over the research and development portion of our company. Uh, so I'm taking over commercial operations. And after spending the last 20 years of my life building and operating data centers, uh, the MIT Forum asked me to come in today and help moderate this panel. And I'm really excited to do so. If we can have our panelists join us up here on the stage, we'd appreciate that. <clears throat> From a format perspective this evening, <clears throat> myself and our distinguished panel uh, we'll be providing questions and uh, feedback to the folks here at Childine for the first part of the evening. Uh, once we've completed that section, we're going to open it up uh, to audience participation and Q&A. Uh, we think that's a critical piece of this. These guys have spent the last hour educating us in their business, and we know there's a lot of brilliant minds here in the lobby. Uh, we'd love for you guys all to participate. Um, an hour. As we head through everything this evening, <clears throat> please make sure uh, if you have a question during the initial phase, please write it down. There's a uh, note paper and stuff in front of you so we don't forget. We want these guys to get as much value out of this interactive process as possible. Uh, and we're really excited about that. <clears throat> if we'd like, um, we go ahead and introduce our panel. We'll start there. John, you want to get started? Anybody else's mics work? <laughs> While we're working on mics, uh, the board that we've assembled this evening has a tremendous amount of background, uh, both from a technical and complex hosting experience to financial background, all of which will provide some significant insight to the folks here at Chilldine. Uh, we're looking forward to their participation. Uh, we're kind of going at this from a boardroom perspective. Uh, I'm going to help moderate the conversation, and then we're going to go back and forth with the panel. Uh, and uh, pepper the guys at the Childine team with a bunch of questions and see if we can't help uh, flesh out uh, some clarity around the model and their approach. Um, so we've heard about some of the challenges uh, that you guys have outlined. We've got them up here on the board, right? Uh, from a, a flow perspective, we're going to start the evening off talking about the business model, right? Uh, the challenge that you're going after, the way that you solve it, uh, your model and your sales approach, uh, and the way that you guys have got a hook, the marketing sizzle that you guys put on your product. From there, we'll move on to some of the other challenges, the more minute details, uh, things about the size of your organization and the challenges that face when you're trying to get in front of the new opportunities that are ahead of you. And we'll close with what may be the most important part of the topic and the exciting part, which is talking about how to gain investment and the dollars you'll need to progress the company. Okay? So let's start with that from the, the very beginning, uh, from a business model perspective. Having heard the presentation that these guys gave us tonight, uh, we'd like to start with questions specifically about marketing approach, the product, uh, and their go-to-market strategies. John, with your mic with... now, if you can also introduce yourself as we get started. Okay, I, I'm John Bean. I'm a uh, serial entrepreneur from San Diego, and in a variety of startups for the last 25 years or so. Uh, Pixis was my first one here, uh, became CareFusion, was recently acquired by BD, and my most recent one was EcoATM, uh, which was acquired by the Coinstar people back in 2013. And now I've started yet another startup, and I'm uh, actually an Evo Nexus portfolio company, and my new company is, is called Mem Computing. Um, looking at this, I guess what I really wonder is why you don't just focus on the equipment, equipment suppliers? Uh, the reason is, is that our uh, competitors have already um, gone through the equipment suppliers and they've gone through all kinds of, of demos and developments and so on and then not sold anything. Basically because 
They haven't, they made a whole bunch of promises about extracting 100% of the energy of a server and only getting 50%. So that they're not really meeting expectations. Um, so the server vendors haven't already gone through a few cycles of liquid cooling vendors. Now they're a little cautious. And what they say is, hey, I'll tell you what, you show up with a customer and we'll develop a server, a liquid cooled server to go with that customer. But we're not going to spend a lot of time developing a product around your liquid cooling system until we know there's a customer for it. So for example, uh, Dell has a server that they have cooled by Cool IT, one of our competitors. And I haven't talked to them in a while, but as far as I know, they haven't really sold anything. Um, so basically what they're looking for is some kind of market traction at this point uh, before they diversify and have multiple liquid cooling vendors. Uh, having said that, the technology people at Dell love our solution, but uh, they, we don't have a strong partner, whereas Cool IT has partnered with another company, Stalls, which does a lot of air handling equipment for data centers. So, so that's kind of what we run into is that the server vendors, you know, they, they went outside with other liquid cooling vendors. They didn't really sell anything. They developed their own stuff. They didn't really sell anything. Um, I'm talking about HP and Dell. Um, the other ones would be, you know, Cray and, S, Cray and SGI are, or, um, well, SGI is now part of HP. But Cray has their own liquid cooling technology. It's very expensive. They sell it to the DOD. And, and the same, or similar things with Cray. But basically, so that's the problem is that before they spend the money on engineers reviewing our stuff, they want to know that we're strong enough to break it through their purchasing process, and we're not. Ron, well, and you mentioned uh, IBM, what, that they're looking. Is there any hope there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is, there is hope there. We've talked to our, uh, our Korean VAR is trying to sell a deal with an IBM servers, because their latest GPU servers come only liquid-cooled with the IBM servers and our negative pressure liquid cooling system that they're already familiar with, and they have an exclusive deal for Korea with that stuff. So yes, there is, there is hope, um, just because we have the, the brave Koreans um, willing to, to bet the farm on us. Well, and, and, that, and that sales opportunity got us talking to the thermal experts at IBM in the US, and they were uh, actually take, a little taken aback, but pleasantly so as how intuitive and simple this was to have negative pressure. And their quote was something like, we've shipped millions of these connectors and only 20 of them have leaked. That's still, that might pass ISO, you know, Malcolm Baldridge, 0.99 whatever, 99 point whatever, whatever of, of, taller, of a success. There's still 20, There's still 20 customers that are really upset. Yeah. So, um, so even, even the IBM people at that point are, I think, eyes open, kind of, you know, potentially looking for a way to work with us. Ron, you want to give a little bit of your background because it relates directly to what these guys are doing and then sure. fire away. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ron Hawkins. I am with the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is uh, part of UC San Diego. And it's one of the uh, top three uh, academic supercomputing facilities in the, in the US. Um, I, at SDSC, I run our industrial partners program, which is um, our program for engaging industry with our researchers, with our technology, and with our systems. And I've been, uh, been working in HPC a little over 10 years now, so I think I've uh, developed a, a decent, decent perspective on the, on, at least on the HPC side of things. But uh, I, have, uh, I have a comment. I'll try to turn it into a question by the end. But uh, <laughs> you know, when you guys were presenting, I, I, you know, I was thinking about the SDSC situation, and we have uh, on UCSD campus an 18,000 square foot data center in a very constrained uh, footprint. Um, UCSD is closing data centers right now. The chance they're going to build another data center in the future on campus, I, I won't say it's zero, but I think it's pretty darn low. So I was thinking, you know, that's an interesting situation when you get um, an enterprise that uh, is at the crux where they're going to have to look at building data center footprint. 
I mean, we're and our data center is fill, filling up. I, I meant to mention it's not quite full, but it's close. And so that would seems to me like that would be a huge opportunity for you guys to mm -hmm. find that customer who's going to be in a lot of pain very soon. Get your um, CDU infrastructure in there as an enduring piece of infrastructure uh, to enable them to densify without being locked in to a vendor like an IBM or a, a Cray. And then, um, you know, then, then mm -hmm. you're golden, right? Um, so, you know, I, I guess the question is, have you guys thought about that scenario and, and have you thought about... Um, so we'll, we'll be happy to plant one of our CDUs in your data center. <laughs> like I said, we're not quite there yet. But no, we've, uh, we've, we have... But maybe within a couple of years. Yeah, it, we think that's an important part of what we can do is, you know, we can, we can give much longer legs to an existing data center. So one way to think about it is, Think of, of uh, you, you have a, a data center with, with one unit of air capacity that cools that data center right now. And so, um, and we could say, you know, that one unit of air you have with our liquid cooling being added to the mix, you could go to four to five units of power with your one unit of air as, you, as long as you let us take out the, the heat with our liquid. And so all of a sudden, you could go from one unit of, of you know, data center servers in that footprint to four or five. Um, and, and, our, and our approach is, yes, it's, it's unique and proprietary to us, but it does, it's, it does not tie our user into any particular OEM, IBM, HP, Lenovo, Dell, Cray, SGI, whatever. You know, we can interface with all those different things. Um, so, you know, that's an important, an important aspect. We've talked with some HVAC companies that are close. Uh, there's one group up in Orange County um, that's close to Caltech people, and they've got this problem they're kind of dealing with right now. And, you know, I've talked to them a couple times, and it's always, you know, the next pitch they're going to bring it up kind of thing. But, you know, you, life's a long time to keep irritating them. Eventually, maybe, you, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. it comes your way. It, Mr. Reese, uh, I know you come from a financial background, uh, and I know we're talking about the business uses today, but if you could introduce yourself and fire some questions away. Hi, uh, John Reese. I'm a 30-year finance and accounting professional. Mostly semiconductors and software, a brief stint in the DOD world. Uh, the last 20 years, I've been in the entrepreneurial environment. Uh, I was a co-founder of a software company yeah. software company focused on um, test analysis for semiconductor engineers. Um, five people and a dog <laughs> in the garage. <laughs> and we took it a pretty long way, ran into the dot bomb bubble. Uh, several other entities since then, a couple of successful exits. So I know your pain. I have been where you are. Um, my question would be, You've, done a, you've identified your strategic initiative. You're going after the national labs. I have a bit of experience with Sandia National Lab in my last job. Have, have you conceived of the program you're going to have with them? Are you going to sell them the equipment? Are you going to give it to them for free? What are they going to provide you in terms of the reference? What time frame will that be? And I ask that because the labs, in my experience, are slower than you will want them to be. So can you just, I guess the question is, can you describe how you envision your relationship with these national labs to benefit, you know, and provide okay, so, these reference accounts? So for, for example, with, with uh, Sandia, uh, the guy there, Dave Martinez, I've been talking to him for a few years. Um, he installed a ACE attack system at Sandia. Uh, he was not entirely happy with it. Um, basically, they realized that they need liquid cooling. They've tried one flavor of it. They weren't entirely happy with it. They want to try some other flavors. So what we had outlined with him is a deal where we would liquid cool a few racks, and then we'd move those racks to the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, where everybody could come in and look at it and see it, and you could publish the data because it's not a DOD lab. So we kind of had outlined that, you know, pretty comprehensively as a 
as a demo. And he also mentioned the idea of cooling the racks that he has with, with our liquid cooling instead of the original one. Are they going to be making an investment as in pay yeah, for they, this? They have, they have investment money for this application. Um, I, I don't know the details of, of you know, where the money comes from and so on and so forth, but they, they have money to upgrade the uh, energy and compute infrastructure at the national labs. Well, um, I, I think John's points about the national labs are well taken. I, I did want to um, take the opportunity to comment, and I made a note here that I, I do like your strategy going after the national labs. I think that, um, a, at least for HPC, um, they have the uh, Vanguard program where they can acquire uh, substantial HPC systems without, um, you know, that are forward-looking technology-wise, and and they aren't, you know, necessarily. Uh, compelled to go with the tier one uh, HPC vendors that we've been talking about, and they have the technical uh, chops to integrate their own systems and so take some risks there. So I think I think they are uh, I think it's a good target for you, uh, notwithstanding that they you know they're they're going to you know they're going to be tough and they're going to put you through through the ringer. But I think you know if if you find the right one to partner with, they you know that will help you in the end because they'll. Um, you know they'll they'll compel you to you know figure out what the right features and and you know how to improve your technology to get to the next level. You know we also had a really good uh, um, discussion with um, the, DO, the DoD Maui. They have an HPC center in Maui, and um, and they've used a lot of different liquid cooling. And it was the DoD um, executive who Steve quoted said he's never going to buy another server that's not liquid cooled. And part of what makes um, it make a lot of sense over in Mau in uh, Hawaii in particular is they're spending 25 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Yeah. Our 16 month payback in our, in our case study is assuming seven cents a kilowatt hour, not 25. So the California average is 11 for industrial, US average is seven, it's 25 in Hawaii. So that 16 month payback goes to five months in Hawaii. So it's a, it's a big point of, uh, of pain over there, um, which I think you know, could very well factor into their re receptivity to a deal there. Yeah, I, I would just uh, add that um, Maui has been designated by the DOD as a Vanguard center a different vanguard than the National Labs vanguard, but they are supposed to be uh, the DOD's center now for looking at advanced technologies. And, and in fact, um, just uh, either last week or earlier this week, they released a, a broad agency announcement um, talking about some of the technologies they want to look at. So you guys should look that up and uh, see if there's an opportunity to apply for some funding. Yeah, they, they asked for a white paper and I sent them an outline. So. Um, and I think they, they had used the IBM liquid cooled systems and they, they, when they took it out, they didn't just take out the computers, they tore out all the plumbing too. So it sounded to me like they weren't, maybe they weren't exactly happy with the IBM systems, but they didn't say so. I guess the rumor is that the IBMs have a very high uh, maintenance cost. Well, and one of the things that we, it, it comes out, and I think it came out when we talked with uh, the, Laura, the woman Laura at the Maui DOD, and the, and the same thing happens with the, the our other cool IT and ACE attack is they end up having a very distributed pumping system. So technically speaking, you end up with having a plumber installed tap with what pressure and temperature controlled water at a lot of different places in the data center where we only have to do it at one place where we put up our CDU. All the connections behind the CDU are just with wire wrapped flexible tubing which is any facility or data center tech can install that, where the other guys have to plumber install every cabinet or every other second or third cabinet, which makes a tremendous difference in cost up front and the complexity of trying to move things around if you want to um, on any sort of remodel. So, so you know, uh, John Reese and Ron both talked about how that sales model may have some delays that might go a little longer than you guys are anticipating, right? But it's clear that you've built a, a better mousetrap, right? Your solution provides value to an existing problem 
and the math works out behind it. Have you guys provide, do you have any more feedback for the panel and does the panel have any further suggestions of how you may analyze the sales motion and figure out what else may happen if some of those initial sales requirements take a little longer than uh, expected? <laughs> so that if, if the initial sales effort right uh, around the national labs right takes longer than expected, what else can we do to accelerate the, the, the adoption of your technology other than putting margaritas in the lines? Right. <laughs> well, we, we've we've uh, we have we have good repeat interest in the margarita machine. We were at the Connect last year, and uh, um, it was uh, it was requested. There's also um, oil and gas. Those people are pretty. As, as HBC customers, they don't mind doing things they're a little bit off the beaten path. And of course, you know, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Ebays, all those kind of people, they have, they have groups of engineers to study how to save money in the data center. So they, they're interested as well. And, and we've been working with, with them, you know, off and on. So those are, I mean, so there's a lot of other opportunities we're looking at. Um, the other thing is that there are areas where we hadn't even thought of our product being uh, saleable. For example, cooling electronics for Navy ships or um, cooling electronics for electric car manufacturers. I mean, in that case, you know, you're going into just a green field where no one's ever been there before. So you're not up against air, you're up against we don't have a solution. This, this electronics is putting out a lot of power in a very small space. We have to liquid cool it. Why don't we use the chill line system uh, because it's safer? So, now that's a whole, that's a whole other market for us. I mean, it doesn't take, at this stage, the company's small enough, it has a ridiculously small burn rate. Um, you know, we just need a few of those deals to, to really get us going. Get more aggressive with the testing and the trial systems to get in front well, of more and we, we just signed an MOU with someone who's working in-house with a, you know, um, a company that does uh, chip, I mean, industrial testing, electronic testing of equipment, um, and so our cooling would would be of a lot of value to the way they ordinarily do their 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 product design, and so we you know we 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 signed an MOU with them about a month ago, and I mean that's the kind of thing that may take you know may take six months, it may take three years, but that that could come back to be something at some point, um, but we do see uh, we see a lot of opportunities. People are starting to talk about. 5G antenna amplifier systems that would be coming with the next 5G. So if anybody's really tapped into the technical people at Qualcomm that know uh, how that's going to be rolling out, we'd love to hear any in, in any connections, and that's great because we there's a they're going to have to retrofit, make janitor closets, data centers all over L, downtown LA and everything. We can run one little water line up and down to a, to a radiator on the roof. And you turn the closet into a data center, which you can't do with air conditioning. So what we're doing here could end up being the, you know, the, the tail on the elephant if we find the right vertical that's really going after something. You find the right elephant? Yeah, certainly. I, IoT, 5G, artificial intelligence, you know, uh, deep learning, all those things are driving the industry towards your solution. The, the trick is now yeah, to be capturing the interest and getting some. Uh, yeah, and, we, and we talked with someone just last week who's approaching some of the, you know, the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin mining people, and they're putting 30 megawatt data centers. They're trying to put, you know, blah blah blah. They're going to have to cool those things, and it's ridiculous what that system looks like right now. Um, so there's a lot of people in very weird places trying to do, you know, high power computing, and you know. Ideally, we, we have a better way to cool it than anybody else. Right. Well, let's tap into the, the knowledge of our board here. Uh, one of the other requests that you guys had was to talk about the business model itself. So you've got your, your product business and you're looking to build a recurring piece. Uh, what feedback does the board have around the existing models or questions about how these guys might uh, go to market with that particular piece? Uh, listening to what you're just saying about these alternate opportunities. Uh, have you considered just it, pivoting? I mean, because you, if you, the way that you're selling it right now, the way what you presented today, your investors aren't going to like to hear you talking about that stuff. They want you to focus. But if you're finding that the path to get there is more resistant and there might be these new opportunities, can you do it with less money and uh, 
it, is, it, maybe that's a way to go. Right, right now, if, if someone was willing to pay for development money, we can do it with no money, with no investment. If someone says, we need you to develop a liquid cooling system for X, and nobody's developed one before, so there's no competitor, but we like your technology, I mean, that's a perfect opportunity for us to, to have non-dilutive, we'll just grow the company that way. Because, I mean, the big stumbling block right now is that to get into a decent-sized data center, you have to have the strength to prove to someone you'll be around to support uh, the system for years. And we don't have that strength right now. But if someone has no alternative, um, then, of course, you know, we're just as good as the other guys. But that's a different cell. Yeah, it, it is a different cell. I mean, but, you know, what, what the RFQ we got last week was just somebody found us on the internet, said, hey, we, we want a negative pressure liquid cooling system. We like the idea, the technology, um, you know, give us a bid. So, I mean, that, that could help us take off. But, and we had a, a request for a quote from a, a defense electronics company, and they wanted a liquid cooling system for a, a part on a Navy ship. And then we realized, wow, this is great. Negative pressure, liquid cooling systems. If there's battle damage, it still works. This is great for the, for the Navy as well. So, um, you know, Steve, we've been talking for a few years now, and, and I, uh, yeah, I remember, you know, when we when we first started talking, you were looking at retrofitting, uh, you know, kind of existing servers with with cooling, and and I, I really like how your strategy has evolved over the years. I, I like the. Uh, I like the, you know, what you guys talked about um, with, you know, getting your CDUs, um, you know, in, in place as data center infrastructure and then sort of, um, you know, having that enduring and then changing out the servers as they, they come and go over the years. And that, that really, that sounds a lot more appealing. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, there's still challenges, but, you know, I think if you can get into that, um, that new data center construction where somebody wants a really uh, dense data center and then, you know, Childine just becomes a piece of the, you know, the fixed infrastructure. I, I, I like where that's that's gone. Um, I think a little bit, uh, just a last comment on the last part of the discussion it was, was uh, you know, I really feel that like this is a crossing the chasm kind of deal and and you need that, you need that customer that's really going to work with you, you know, and put you through the ringer and, and become that reference account for you. And, and that's, that's why I like the national lab strategy and you know it's I mean it's easy for me to say I don't have to make payroll every month but um, <laughs> but you know it's, I, I think it's appealing and I think you kind of had that with the Korean customer they ju it just didn't pan out in a way that you can kind of leverage that for what you need to do next we definitely had the ringer part <laughs> as a member of your board um, I, I want to amplify what John mentioned you you need to be able to pivot should you need to. Um, you identified a number of potential other alternatives. Uh, I think you want to rank order those in terms of A, B, and C, D, whatever they are. This is your primary strategy, mm -hmm. but have those kind of in your back pocket. Uh, if the National Lab has taken two to three years to get you the data you want, mm -hmm. you've got to have an option to get data from somebody else. So figure those out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> to make sure that we address all of your concerns this evening, I, I think we'll talk a little bit now about uh, you know, one of the challenges you've got up there in number one about you know, how the size of your organization right, is making it somewhat challenging to get in front of or to earn the trust of some of the large customers. The board have some feedback for these guys about ways that they might uh, adjust strategy or ways that they could impress upon larger customers um, that, that faith and trust and uh, get through the door or the gatekeeper? One thing, you have to fake it till you make it. Um, you, you need to have um, a marketing strategy that demonstrates, shows the, the potential clients that you're in it and you're a big deal. You don't have to tell them we're six people. You don't have to tell them we got a million and three in revenue last year. It's all about marketing. Um, when they want to come to your plant and see your data center, okay, then you have to deal with, with that at that point. But right now, John said it earlier, it's about the sell. 
and you have to market the company as a big player, even though you're not yet a big player. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen at least one of my one of our competitors kind of sell his liquid cooling system on kind of a um, an emotional basis. You know what I mean? And they haven't had any success, although they've been, been in business for longer than we have. And I think one of the reasons for that is with a liquid cooling cell, you've got a few gatekeepers to go through, the data center operator, the facilities manager, you know, the, the CFO, and you got to, you know, you might be able to get one of those people on an emotional, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, but it's hard to get past all three of them. You won't get the CFO. <laughs> you won't get that guy until or that guy or gal until um, until everybody else has bought in and you have a champion. You got to find the champion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have some champions, <laughs> and uh, we're working them. I, I don't want to be a. Uh, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse necessarily, but I'll tell you what I'm hearing is you need to pivot. You're going into a market that sucks. Nobody is doing a good job. You're going after national labs that are not motivated to move quickly. They will not. <laughs> They're going to go slower than you want. They're not going to give you the information you want. They're going to push your buttons, and they're going to try to break you, which is good, except that it's only going to extend your timeline. And I, I think, I, it, and I'm a startup kind of guy, so I like smaller things. You're never going to look like a big company to them. And, but all these other pivoting things, nobody cares what size you are. They're small, you're small. Right. I, I think you could, it's, it's, it'll take less funding. I think you'll have more reference accounts. You don't have to give up on, on uh, data centers. I mean, uh, obviously that's a huge win if you can do it. But in order to get there, maybe you turn, go the other way. I, I, that's, Everything mm -hmm. that else that I'm hearing just isn't exciting, and it's or it sounds. I, I can't give you any better I, any better advice, right? So the only advice I can give is go after these new exciting things. Mm -hmm. We're doing it, <laughs> but I mean, focus. I mean, just do that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing um, you know, I have a comment to offer. I think just a question. I mean, have you what have you looked at in terms of um, you know, of, of uh, partnering, you know, strategic partners, e either in, you know, data, data center equipment, you know, or, or uh, infrastructure, oh, yeah. or, um, or partnering with, you know, uh, companies that you now perceive as competitors and, you know, joining, joining forces. Well, yeah, one, one obvious partner for us is um, air conditioning companies that would see uh, a chunk of their revenue reduced by liquid cooling. So we're actually talking to one of those right now. And we're, you know, we're far apart on, on what deal we, we might do, um, you know, but they're, they're interested. They see the value of what we're doing as a proprietary technology compared to what they have, which is anyone can copy it once they start selling it up. So, um, so the, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the avenues we're working on, you know. Just like, you know, John said, you know, pivot. Yeah, we're doing that. We're, we're working with the electric car company. Partner. Yeah, we're doing that. You know, so we've got a lot of things we're trying to do at the same time, you know, to, to get to the point where, um, you know, <clears throat> someone just, just bites. I will add that in, in uh, just uh, prepping for this earlier today, I was lo looking at Abulient, which is a, a start, uh, you know, one of your erstwhile uh, startup competitors. And, and I did notice there they had... Uh, made a press release related to um, uh, EVs, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, because all the electric vehicle companies have liquid-cooled electronics, but generally within a car company, there's already experts in liquid cooling, because most cars, are, just about all of them, I think, are liquid-cooled now. I think the last air-cooled Porsche was 10 years ago, so. So we, we heard John talk about fake it till you make it. We've heard, you know, sales and marketing and get past the, uh, get past that hump is just a critical thing for you guys. And uh, I saw in your presentation that you are, have already targeted sales resources and business development resources that could come on and help. It sounds like if that's the, 
the magic milestone, getting over that hump and getting your technology into a place where you can reference it, that that needs to be, as John said, an absolute and critical focus for the business. And um, you know, I, I don't know the folks that you're targeting today, but if your competitors, and this is something that's happened to my company, uh, I don't condone the practice, but uh, you know, your competitors at Isotope, uh, your competitors at some of the other folks that have a book of business, that understand the market very well, and can walk you into some of those larger accounts and maybe speed up the sales process, maybe a target for you know, where you wanna go and spend money in your next round. Uh, bringing those people in, because you've obviously got you know, the business mind taken care of, you've got the technology piece taken care of, you, you need that sales and marketing person to go out there and knock a couple doors down, because that's going to be the key that opens the next door for you guys. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on it. We're working on trying to get our sales guy to come on board come for on stock board. only. Okay. okay. Good. So there's a, a final topic, and we've already touched on some of it this evening, uh, as we talk about pivoting the model and all those type of things, but it's, it's about raising capital, right? Uh, and that's something that you guys are looking for. So from a board perspective, right, what suggestions and, uh, and help can we offer these guys as they go and approach folks that uh, may want to make an investment? They've talked about a great return that they can get. You know, how do they get there? The debt holders, how many, are any of them have a bigger appetite to continue going? Um, you know, it's it, it's not our, when we've, we've talked to them a couple different times, about half of them are tied to the previous CEO. So there's not a lot of the, the, the affinity that brought, and, and, and unfortunately they're also the ones that wrote the biggest checks. Um, so, you know, so they're half of the count and probably two thirds of the money. Um, I brought the 200,000 that we got this last year, early in 2017, through my network. Um, so I think, you know, I think we can probably do more with them, but we'd also just like to close them out and have them. And so that's why we want to just do this million dollar series, uh, you know, seed series, and just close that out, convert it, raise enough money to, you know, put a BD guy out there working. You know, go to some more trade shows. You know, and uh, really, you know, we we're so close to hitting on so many of these fronts that we just need to get some of these demo. It funds building a bunch of demo systems that we could, you know, loan out instead of having to sell them every time to some of these uh, uh, people to evaluate. So, um, but you know, in part of this, just because as we've gotten to be more known, you know, we've had contacts and people coming to us through this you know, SD rain and through the CEC to where, you know, there are chances to work together to develop products if we find a partner that wants to develop it with us. Um, and it would be paid for by the government, so. Okay. Um, it will be a challenge to get an institutional investor to put in a billion dollars. Right. They're gonna wanna put a whole lot more money in at work. Um, so the million dollar raise is going to be likely angel investors. And something to be mindful of, the, the legal cost of putting together a preferred stock financing is going to take a chunk of that million dollars. And I don't know that your angel investors are, wow, we're going to take $100,000 and it's going to just go to the lawyers? So that that will be a, that will also be a challenge. Um, if you can make a compelling case to do another debt financing, another angel convertible debt financing on, on more favorable terms to the company because you've de-risked the investment, but uh, you really should think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's a good that's a good thought and. Uh... The $3 million piece, yeah, that's going to be institutional, and my instincts are that it's going to be more than $3 million. But right now, I think, as, as your board member, I'm trying to figure out how to get you to next year in 18 months, which is what you've told me your target right. is. Mm -hmm. And along that, that topic, right, from, from a board perspective, right, it sounds like the, the proof of concept engagements that you guys are doing with customers, um, you know, how, how readily, your cash burns rather low, right? 
uh, but I, I would assume that there's some equipment cost that goes into those. What, what would it take to, to hyperinflate the activity around proof of concept? Say, hey, look, these are our top 20 targets. We're going to get ultra aggressive with our approach towards them, put them out there on very low cost, no type type engagements that have some type of term limit to them, but to accelerate that process. And obviously, they've got to have a need or a demand. But given the, the virtue and the, and the benefits that come from your solution, it, maybe it wouldn't be too hard to target the top 20 folks and just get systems in their hands to try to get past that next the, stage. The thing is, is that's what our, our competitors have already done. And so the, the people are a little bit burned out on that because if I get a free system but I spend $20,000 on engineering and tech time to evaluate it, it wasn't really free. So... So actually, you know, we've been advised not to give stuff away because then people are like, yeah, well, we'll just put it in the corner. We'll get to it when we get to it. Um, and we actually did one system for Alcatel where the, the guy who was supposed to work on it got reassigned and the company got sold and never found your stuff again. Yeah, they never even touched it as far as we know. <laughs> so, um, so, but I, th I think really our, our, you know, the path we're already taking, which is to try and get our BD guy on board for stock only, so it's not a hit on our cash, and, and get him out there touting our stuff. Helping move That's us. probably our best bet, which is kind of what we're doing. Any, what we're on is on our plan anyway. Well, with that, um, I'd like to turn the questioning over to the audience, and to do that, uh, we don't have enough microphones to pass them around the. The audience, so if you would like to form a line up here and use this microphone to ask the questions so that everybody else can hear them, uh, please do. Yep. Yeah, there he is. Form a line or a point. Who wants to come on up? <laughs> Eight to ten inches. There you go. <laughs> Inches, not feet. <laughs> yeah. Someone back there, yeah. So this is kind of riffing off on what John Bean was saying. If speak into the mic. So this is so this is riffing off on what John Bean is saying. That why are you trying to make anything at all? Why not just remain a custom engineering house based upon the technology? and just focus on it that way, and you probably don't need VC money to be doing that, and you probably just need marketing muscle to be doing that, and the closest analogy is DNK engineering. They don't compete with HP for making printers, they design custom stuff. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what we were doing <laughs> at Flowmetrics, right? We're engineering stuff. Um, we've been doing that for quite a while. Thought, wow, why don't we become a product company? We'll get rich. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if that worked the way we thought it would. But, um, but yeah, we, we still have that opportunity. We can do that whenever we want to. And we are continuing to do that. If we, particularly if we get people coming in and saying, we want you to develop something around IP that we already own. So the IP that we develop is ours. That's fantastic. We, we love doing that. You know, and, and as, as we're discussing here, um, I realize that there is kind of an advertising outlet that we haven't used, which is Electronic Cooling Magazine. You know, we could do an article on what we do, and, and uh, people who need to solve electronic cooling problems are reading that magazine or looking at it online. So that's a, that's a perfectly good way to, to advertise our services for custom engineering, which definitely keeps the doors open. And, and there's about a half, half of the solution as a custom engineered piece, which is to, you know, how to interface with inside the server to cool that server. The other half of the solution is just this fixed, uh, the fixed pumping system. And it's just the size of a normal server cabinet, so two feet by four feet by six and a half feet. And that'll interface with whatever servers you have on the other side. So, um, yeah, the, the only engineering you have is trying to, you know, figure out how to develop a hybrid heat sink that will go on that, inside that server. But once you've, you know, most of the, at this point, most of them that are out there are Intel, Xeon based, which are all the same footprint. It's just a question of, you know, how tall is the thing. And so um, there's not that much server, you know, engineering service involved to really, deliver the solution, which does give you a lot of leverage 
Um, it ends up being one of the real positive aspects of bidding on these, uh, being part of these newer data centers because they have a very long lead time on, on, on the build out and they're knowing with you know, six months to a year in advance that we want equipment to be ready to go into this data center, um, which then lets us go have a heat sink made in China for you know, 20 cents on the dollar compared to what we did last year because we have enough lead time and now all of a sudden you really can lower the price or make higher margin or hopefully both and uh, mm -hmm. go forward. Okay, got a question here? My name is Tim Orlando and for those of you in the audience that have heard, seen the term SE Rain, let me mention that um, that's the San Diego Regional Energy Innovation Network and uh, John McMillan back here, where's John? And I are actually founding board members of that group. It, it, we started at San Diego State. It includes USD and UCSD as full partners, along with Connect. And we're here to support Childine. They were admitted into our group. Um, and what's important about this is that our task, if you will, from the state of California, is to support companies that they believe can produce significant ratepayer benefit. That's our mission. And we believe this is true because of how much energy usage that they did. In fact, uh, since Ron's there, the only reason that UCSD built all their solar panels is because his center sucks up all the energy in the western United States. When in the morning when you can't get your TV to work properly, it's because Ron's flicked on his supercomputer and we're all dying for electricity. But the point is, they're full member, they've been admitted into the cluster. We believe they have something here. We've done a certain amount of due diligence on them. We're supporting them in trying to obtain state grants, and we appreciate you guys being here. So there's a lot of resources most of you may not be aware. The cluster is only about a year old. We have about 30 companies admitted into the cluster, and we're trying very hard to get these early stage companies advanced, but we think they really have something going on. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Other questions in the audience? We promise we won't make you come to the podium. Okay, right around the corner there. Excellent. <laughs> you want to be an idiot. Uh, my name is Rocky Vienna. Uh, I've been involved in data center operations in one way or another my entire career. Um, most recently, I was the chief operating officer of Keyote Networks here in San Diego, operating two data centers. Um, I, th I think part of the problem is your solution isn't sexy, unless you're a mechanical engineer. Um, or a data center facilities manager whose back up is up against the wall because he's got no power and he has to replace his chillers. So in, in all due respect to, to, uh, to John Reese, I think your cell is to a CFO. It's a cost, it's, it's, it's a cost solution. So I, I, I think I, I, I would start there and have the CFO sold on the idea and then talk to the technicians behind the, behind the, the, the curtain to, to show that you have a viable solution for them. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a... Not sure it'll speed up your sales cycle, but it certainly may be another alternative, <laughs> right? And, and frankly, working with any government uh, organization, it's a long, hard slog. <laughs> You're not gonna get any fast results. Was there another question in the back? Just kind of just adding on to the, the previous question, how does your system compare on cost or price for the system? You've got the savings, but how much up front does someone have to spend versus you know, the air cooling or the other types of water cooling? So, so typically with our system, if you're building a new data center, your air conditioning costs get cut by 75% because you don't have to put in as much air conditioning. And we're just a small part of that saving. So say you're gonna spend whatever, a million dollars on air conditioning. Now you're gonna spend $250,000 on air conditioning and maybe $350,000 on our stuff. So you, you save money right from the get-go by going, by, go, by going liquid instead of buying a whole bunch of air conditioning. Yeah, one, the, we have a, a case study that goes on with an online Schneider Electric um, <clears throat> uh, pricing tool and for a, a, a unit of new data center construction, the air cooling cost um, that they quoted is 490000 and then we show that our cost to do that same amount of cooling is $300,000. So we started $190,000 ahead 
And then in that case, at the seven cents an hour, kilowatt hour labor average US, you save 86,000 a year. And so after about a year and a half, you, you're ahead of the game um, with, our, with our system. Um, so if it's a, if it's a, a new data center, um, we, you know, there's, there's a very strong case. If it's, a, if it's a retrofit where we're giving you additional life, there's a very strong case. Um, if, it's a, if it's a facility in the middle of nowhere that doesn't care how much density they have in their footprint, then you know, we have, it's very hard for them to make a case for us because they're not valuing their real estate and their density. So um, it's not for everybody, um, but in the places where it's dense and, and cities and that sort of thing, um, you know, I, I met the, the Microsoft hired a guy as director of sustainability about a year ago. He came from Starbucks. And it's funny, we have a call with Microsoft tomorrow, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out kind of where this thing came from. It might have been from him. But uh, I remember meeting this guy at a conference and I introduced him myself, and I thought if anyone's going to care about this, it'd be the guy in charge of sustainability. Um, that's what really, you know, they're taking a lot of. CO2 emissions out and a lot of electricity savings. And uh, he said the feedback he had is, well, you know, we, we don't need to worry about, you know, data center efficiency and, and how much density you're getting because we have this new, you know, LinkedIn data center up in Oregon that's, you know, it's in the, the lands free and it's a, you know, it's a huge place. And I said, well, what's your comparable in Singapore to that facility? Anyway. Hmm, I not really thought about that one yet. And that may be why we're having such good take up over in Asia, because it's hot and it's hotter in Singapore and it's, you know, real estate's really expensive. So now going back and reclaiming five or four or five footprints as you put in your one is worth a lot of money in an expensive, hot environment. And that's clearly not the case in rural Oregon. So it's, you know, it's, it's going to take a little while to find the right customer that wants to go with it, but there's a lot of compelling story behind it. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, very cool technology, Steve. Um, I would love to see it smaller and more focused. I think it's a very hardware-centric approach at this point, and I think you're leaving the whole software and what like deep learning and metrics and all of these things that you could be presenting to customers. Um, I think the HPC market is so limited. Um, yeah, they're big facilities, but they're limited. They're, whereas there are other electronic things that run really hot, routers, um, gaming systems, things like that, that I think there's another way to package up the data that you're getting, and I would love to see it smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's one uh, definite application that our customers have asked us about is, well, what if we just want to do one rack? We just want to do one rack to try it out. And <laughs> really small. I mean, the, the thing is, is we originally decided kind of not to get into the single CPU market because, um, it's already pretty crowded with, 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 uh, with, <laughs> with vendors. Um, and also, we, you know, we figured we didn't want to have to talk to all kinds of people with their individual computer problems calling us up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I never wanted my mom to buy a gateway computer when I was there for 10 years. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> but somebody like a Google is, someone like Google is already using deep learning to drive their data center costs down by monitoring what is happening in all the different permutations in their data center. So without that software piece, you're going to be dead in the water. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we talked to Google. I'm sure they, they're probably copying our stuff right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, we have time for one more question from the audience. Has anybody got anything they'd like to share? Excellent. Well, then uh, please join me in thanking our panel as well as the folks from Chilldine.